how the way we farm makes us sell. Dr. Ron Weiss is a botanist, a, a board certified internist, and an assistant professor of medicine at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical Hot School. He's the founder of Ethos Health um, and farm based health care system that connects human health to the natural world and fosters the fundamental connections that exist between all living things. <laughs> Dr. Weiss will discuss how we can make a difference and change our nation's eating habits and cut health care costs and at the same time. And there also will be uh, tapes available uh, at the bookstore. So thank you. So thank you so much everybody for coming. Uh, I know I am underdog up against Superman today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I'll try to give you the best show possible. Um, I think the way I'd like to structure the talk today. Uh, by the way, we're going until what time? Five thirty. So, how many were here for part one? How many were not here for part one? Okay, so maybe about 20%. So what I'd like to do is just really quick over five minutes review part one so we have the context to move on to part two of this lecture. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about, uh, so after I do review part one, uh, we're going to go on to part two. Part two examines really the, in detail, what is wrong with our agricultural system. And, um, and um, then we're going to come up with some solutions uh, on how we can perhaps fix it. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, I'm going to end the lecture and then there will be a question and answer period. So the, the, the lecture is entitled, Farm to Hospital, How the Way We Farm Makes Us Sick. From our, our last lecture five days ago, we learned the following, uh, that we're in, a health, we're in crisis mode as far as our health care system is concerned. And as you can see from this chart, it's really not a health care system. It is a medical care system. It's not a system that makes us healthy. It is a system that dispenses a lot of drugs a lot of doctor visits, a lot of surgeries and procedures, and just keeps us sustained in chronic diseases that are eating up all of our money. And this uh, expenditure is inexorably rising. It can, it's continued rising since here, which is uh, you'll find out is a very important point in time when we get to talking about agriculture. The United States is an outlier compared to all of the other industrialized nations as to what we spend on taking care of people. And it will continue to rise very scarily. Uh, eight years from now, it's, it's, the federal government expects to be spending 20% of all the money we make in this country on Alzheimer's, clogged up arteries, diabetes, um, cancer. It's now 17.5%, a 3.2 trillion, and it will not stop at 20% in eight years from now. And the Affordable Care Act didn't help us. We continue to pay more and more money every year. Uh, not only employers share of, um, of uh, what they have to pay for health insurance goes up, but our share as the employee goes up as well. Uh, people will say, this is due to a health care, a health insurance problem, that health insurance is broken, people don't have a health insurance. People will say it's because of rising drug costs and pharma who's completely out of control and charges $400 for a month's worth of medicines. People will say it's because of we don't have any primary care doctors and there are not enough of them. And this is documented by <clears throat> the American uh, Association of American Medical Colleges. Medical students don't go into the primary area still, and they're the holders of prevention, right? Primary care. We don't have enough of them. There's going to be a severe shortage. 
So what I'm telling you is none of this is the reason for our problem. They are true and valid, all the things I gave you, but it's the United States Department of Agriculture, which is the primary culprit of our unsustainable medical care system because they dictate the way food is grown in this country, which dictates what we eat in this country, which dictates all of the diseases we have to end up paying for. Remember that 86% of that 3.2 trillion we spend are on the stuff you've been here on the boat listening to for the past week. It is re preventable and reversible, especially in its early phases. Right? We don't have to spend this money. We learned about our friend Joyce, right? Who is the poster child of chronic disease. She had everything. And was a nurse practitioner. Life was destroyed within three months of all of a sudden becoming sick, like Job. She, these, these plagues descended upon her. She was completely disabled on disability. Medicare couldn't work. And within a matter of 30 days, most of her stuff vanished. Within a year, it all vanished. Right? All the diseases she had, all the medication she took, the food that she was eating, this is the sad, right? The standard American diet. And you're going to see in our second part that the stuff that our USDA and the Farm Bill, which is coming up for 2018, pays for with your tax dollars, goes straight to make this stuff that Joyce was eating. Doesn't go to grow vegetables. I want to make that clear. Nothing that the USDA's Farm Bill allots for goes for vegetable and fruit and bean and whole grain production. The stuff that you've been eating at the buffets, you've not eaten anything here that's paid for with your tax dollars through the farm bill. It's this stuff. So she went on that 30-day detox. The diabetes, the pain, the ulcerative colitis, all of these problems vanished. went from 27 medications down to zero, and here she is a year later. There is no drug, there is no combination of drugs that can do this, plants do this. And we know exercise is very powerful and important, but Remember that she climbed to the top of this mountain, not being able to walk up those three steps to the medical office six months later. It wasn't because she went to the gym. It was because she was eating plants. So at the end of the lecture, we started to find out about, uh, started to get into our food system. And it's a system, right? and talked about if you go down any main street in america this commonly right we're all from all over america have you seen this kind of thing on a and we're near you i know it fills new jersey okay and then if you say i want to go to the supermarket i won't eat out okay this is what you find in the supermarket right 80 percent comes from farm bill subsidies 80%, which you should not be going near if you want to prevent cancer and if you want to prevent heart attacks. The number one and the number two causes of death in this nation. Okay, so now we're on to part two. Yes, 
<laughs> okay. That's in my happy. But, well, mm, yes and no. So why aren't I happy in this picture? It is a farm. Yes. This is what's paid for with, with uh, let's see, in the last, the last figures we have available, um, which were from like the late 90s to 2010, about 14 years, your tax dollars uh, were spent to the tune of a quarter of a trillion dollars to uh, pour it into growers to grow this kind of stuff. So this looks like corn, right? You can see I'm 5'11". That corn is much taller than I am. Uh, so it looks like corn, and it is corn. But just to be clear, and this is the corn up close, this corn is called feed corn or field corn. And um, most of the corn we're fam familiar with is corn on the cob, right, that you eat, or corn niblets. Uh, that corn is called sweet corn. Um, um, and this kind of corn, basically none of us eat. Uh, it is genetically modified. It has been engineered to be resistant to a lot of herbicides and other things. And it is the number one crop that we grow. Just this year, by the way, it used to be number one. Soybeans for the growing year of 2017 now equal this about 100 million acres of each of these crops are grown in the United States, about 200 million acres. Okay. So I like this. This was, a, this was a little poster from the Indiana State Fair, and it, it, it tries to teach kids what the difference is between corn we generally eat and corn that is grown to feed animals. Okay, so, and this was from, what, 2009. So just to give you a, 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 an indication of the scale on which this is growing, you know, Indiana is a big corn-growing state. It's a big, it's a rural state. And uh, so the corn that people generally eat the most of, this sweet corn, uh, they grew 42 million pounds of it in 2009, but, but 50 billion pounds of the animal feed corn, which humans don't eat. So where does this corn go? So we're going to talk about corn first, and then we're going to go get into the details of soybeans. So corn and soy are the basis for feeding animals in the United States. When I was growing up in the 1960s, I remember that very distinctly for my fifth birthday, I wore um, this little red cowboy suit uh, with little white fringes and a little red hat. It was my favorite. There were still cowboys around, right, in the 1960s, in the 50s and 60s. And that's the way meat was raised. It was um, it was uh, cows or cattle were allowed to graze on ranches and then it took a few years and then you know they were slaughtered and turned into meat. Uh, that doesn't almost doesn't exist anymore that world. Um, it is estimated that probably about 98 percent of all the animal foods that we eat are grown in facilities like this today. 98% of the chicken and the meat and the pork that, and the eggs that uh, Americans eat are grown in CAFOs. CAFOs stand for C-A-F-O, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations. And they're enormous buildings into which animals are cruelly confined and spend basically their entire lives under extremely crowded conditions, uh, which promote disease. So let's take a look at what these animals are fed. So I already told you that um, the basis of the feed that all of these animals are given are corn. That's the number one grain that they're given. Um, 
And there are other grains that are mixed in, but they make up a small percentage of their uh, feed ration. Uh, sometimes sorghum and millet and other, um, other small grains are mixed in, mixed in, but the vast majority are these GMO corn grains, the ones that you saw me holding the picture. And by the way, this analysis came from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York uh, funded the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. And this detailed analysis came from there. So the number two component is soy meal. Uh, so about um, perhaps 98% of all of the soybeans, and I told you um, a moment ago that soybean production has been rising in the United States, uh, so that now soy equals corn. It, it, it had not equaled corn ever before until this past year, 100 million acres each. So 98% um, roughly of all the soy that is grown in this country it is, it is genetically modified, and it is not used for human consumption. It is used for uh, these um, industrialized purposes. Um, the 2% that's left over, a lot of it is used for human consumption, and it's also processed into, um, also processed into refined soy products, like soy isolate that is turned into highly processed foods for human consumption. Soybean oil, right, is huge. Uh, we'll talk about that coming up next, but a lot of the soybeans that are grown are squeezed to get the soybean oil, and then the cakes of soy that is left over are fed to the animals. That's why it says oil meals and cakes. They're not necessarily whole soybeans. Next, rendered animal products. So, if you were to construct a four-lane highway from New York to Los Angeles uh, and fill it bumper to bumper with tractor-trailer trucks, that is the capacity you would need to contain all of the animal byproducts that pour out of these CAFOs. So after they're slaughtered, all of the hair, the bones, the skeletons, the entrails, the skins, the uh, you need that kind of capacity. So that stuff is very valuable stuff to the feed industry. It is taken to rendering facilities and it is boiled down and cooked down and processed to go back into the feed. So in other words, we have cows eating chickens, and chickens eating cows, and cows eating cows, and pigs eating pigs, and pigs eating chickens. They're uh, cannibalistic, okay? These animals, most of them, are basically herbivores. They should not be eating any animal products in order to be healthy, their gastrointestinal systems are not designed to eat these things, right? Cows are supposed to be eating grass. They're not even supposed to be eating corn or grain, they're, right? They're grazers. Imagine what this does to the health of these animals. Besides them being crowded, enveloped by all the sickness, uh, immobilized by lack of space, so it changes their microbiome. Which, which we learned in one of my previous lectures, that's the direct reason why Joyce was able to become healthy. Indirectly, yes, she ate all those plants and stopped eating the processed junk, but she, the plants changed her microbiome and got rid of the inflammation that caused these diseases. Can you imagine what kind of inflammation these animals have? Mm -hmm. This is a major reason why all these animals need to be flooded with antibiotics. They cannot survive eating this kind of diet and not get sick. Next, 4D animals. 4D animals 
um, means disabled, um, diseased, um, dead, or what is the fourth one? You can't get much worse than dead. Disease, <laughs> dying, right? Diseased, dying, dead, or disabled. The USDA allows these animals to be mixed into the feed products, despite the, pro the previous scares that we had about 10 years ago with mad cow disease. It is not illegal to do this currently. Animal waste. These animal facilities produce huge amounts of manure, and this manure is also processed and mixed into the feed. The animals are fed back their own waste. So I'm thinking of why this would be particularly bad in, for the animal and for the eaters of these animals. Uh, has anyone ever heard of the process of biomagnification? Did anyone ever tell you, hey, um, you know, some fish are okay to eat. You just don't want to eat those big fish because they eat the medium fish, the medium fish eat the little fish, and when you have mercury, it just goes up the food chain. That's why tunas, which are 1,200 pounds and 10 feet tall, they eat all the smaller fish below them, and the mercury accumulates in them up the food chain. So when you have contaminants uh, that build up through different levels in the food chain, that's called biomagnification. <laughs> Think about this. All of the chemicals that are on that corn and that soybean and all the pesticides and every all the contaminants that are in there, these animals keep being fed over and over again, generation over generation, their, their waste, okay, which they're pooping out, and their skins and their bones are ground up and fed back to them. So this is why animals, eating animals in general, is uh, a process that allows human beings to be highly contaminated with cadmium, mercury, arsenic, lead, you know, PCBs, dioxins, pesticides, all the stuff that keeps cycling through this system. Now you know why, right? When you eat plants, plants are at the bottom of the food chain, right? So even if you eat plants that are sprayed with pesticides, you're much better off than if you're eating an animal that comes from a place like this. Lastly, we talked about the antibiotics. We talked about, you know, of course, these animals are given hormones to grow faster and all kinds of drugs. This last thing, plastics. There are plastics in meat. And I was shocked to learn out about this. But in reviewing all this data, Johns Hopkins found out that uh, a critical step in the production of especially beef cattle is the last week before they are slaughtered, they are fed pellets of plastic, about a kilogram a day, to keep their guts moving. Because they have so little fiber, they want to make sure that their intestinal tracts are emptied out right, before slaughter, so the manure doesn't contaminate the meat. So that plastic goes into them, right, poop? and then it's fed to the other cows over and over and over again. Imagine what Joyce was eating in all that, that list. Do you wonder why she was so sick? I don't. So now we're going to talk about soybeans. Soybeans has affected the American diet more than any other change in our agricultural system, even more so than corn, and I'm going to show you why in a few minutes. So, Gene, can you see this? Mm. Uh, is there any way to make this bigger, the screen? Okay, I'll try and describe it to you. 
So look at this, how the diets of Americans have changed since 1970. What happened in 1970 in that first slide? Healthcare costs start going up, right? So look how diets have changed. Um, so the blue line is beef. Look at the drop in beef consumption, tremendous. From, let's see, this was from, this goes from 1970 to 2014, so fairly recently. So beef has dropped precipitously. Potatoes also have decreased a lot. Uh, eggs have decreased. Uh, milk down, a full fat ice cream down, margarine has taken a big, big hit. But these are the things that have gone up. For the thing, at the same slope of the curve that beef has decreased, chicken has increased just as steeply. See that? Here's something interesting. Look what happened to cooking oil just since 1970. Vast increase. Actually, it's increasing faster than the consumption of chicken. See, these two joint, these will, this will, line will eventually intersect with chicken on this slope. Corn sweeteners, hmm, that's increased at the same rate, like high fructose corn syrup, which comes, by the way, from that same GMO corn. And of course, corn products, cheese. Remember Dr. Barnard's lecture that we have over over the last hundred years, our, our consumption of cheese has increased from about a pound a year to 34 pounds per year, and it just rises without, without any diminution. Rice has gone up, yogurt a little bit. So here's what's important to know about soybean oil. Remember, I told you all those valuable soybeans, they are processed. Even a lot of them before they're given to those CAFOs, we take the oil out of it, and then the oil is used for human beings to eat. So I know I'm going to explain this to you because I think it's a little bit difficult to see. The blue bars, so this is the fat composition of different kinds of oil, the fat components. And the blue makes up linoleic acid. Does anyone know what linoleic acid is? So linoleic acid is called an omega-6 essential fatty acid. There are some fats that we can uh, make ourselves, but there are some fats that we cannot. And if we do not get these fats in our diet, we will die. They are called essential to life. And this is one of them. Omega-3s. They're also essential. We must also get those. So the way it works with omega-3s and omega-6s are you're always wanting to get, there's a, ratio, a healthy ratio that is best to keep intact if you want to be healthy. Because if you, uh, in, our, in our processed American diet, it's very easy to get omega-6s. It is very hard to get omega-3s. And to be healthy, you want that ratio inverted. You want a lot of omega-3s and relatively little omega-6s. But because we have a soybean-based diet now, because of oil, soybean oil is very high in omega-6s. And this particular one, which is called linoleic acid. OK. So uh, I know there are a lot of charts here. Let me draw your attention oops, to this last, this last chart, this last graph. So this is, n n this is about 1909, about 100 years ago. Look what was going on until 1970. <laughs> Everything was about steady as far as what we were doing. And as far as oil consumption, and look what happened in 1970. Look at the jump in soybean oil consumption. Okay. Here's some other oils. 
just in the 90s, all of a sudden canola oil starts to have a rapid rise. It's spiking up. So uh, in case you can't see it, this graph starts at 1909 and goes to 1999. So in 1970, about the same time that our problem started with our unsustainable finances and healthcare, this occurs. Now, this is in research, this is what's called an association. Can I prove that this is causing us to spend 3.2 trillion a year? I cannot. I didn't do a medical association. But it's interesting that this is associated with almost to the year with a, a rise in our, the same kind of exponential rise in our healthcare costs. Okay, I love this chart. So take a look at this. This is the oils that we were consuming a, a hundred years ago in 1909 versus 1999. In 1909, we were consuming almost no oil, even olive oil, almost nothing. Look at that, point 0.1. And this is, let me see, is it kilos per year? Yeah, kilograms, right there. 0.1 kilogram per year. Okay. Look what happened. We now, this is 116,000% difference, increase in the amount of soybean oil we consume. Even canola, which began to shoot up in the 90s because of canola, the vast tracts of land being committed to canola seed production, that's only 16,000% increase, 116,000. Even olive oil, right, is healthy, right? They tell us, supposedly. Is it healthy? No. no, it's not healthy. It makes you overweight, right? And it makes your arteries dysfunction after you eat it. Even that, we've only seen a 500% difference in consumption in the past 100 years 116,000 percent. So do you remember? That's why I told you there has not been a change to our diet in the past 100 years that has been as powerful and as demonstrative as the consumption of soybean oil. Does anyone know what an uh, omega-3 index is? I alluded to it before with the ratio of three to six, those essential fatty acids we need. So remember what I said, um, omega-6s, six, when they get out of hand, they're thought to be inflammatory. They create in, a lot of inflammation in our body, which then goes to create inflammatory diseases, the chronic diseases. Omega-3s tend to be anti-inflammatory. So you always want, in that ratio, it's called an omega-3 index, you want a large numerator of omega-3s and a relatively small denominator of omega-6s. Oops. Okay. So on this chart, we have the omega-3s index of, it, of measured in 1909, Okay, eating a traditional diet. What does that mean? Well, if you were to eat the regular foods that, that were available in 1909, let's say you were to eat a 1909 chicken, a 1909, you know, a cow that was grazing on the, on the ranch, on the prairie, if you were to eat that, the, you know, non-modern, non-industrialized animal foods, uh, you would have an omega-3 index of 8.28. So, there's a lot of evidence now that in order to prevent Alzheimer's and in order to keep your executive functioning, executive cognitive function in half, you need kind of an omega-3 index if you want to do best at preventing these problems about at least six. Fives, five and a half, six. 
even with the traditional diet a hundred years ago, it was age. Huh, maybe that's why Alzheimer's was unknown at the turn of the century. If you were to eat the kind of diet that they were eating it proportion-wise, using, um, you know, still eating pigs and cows, whatever, but in the same proportions they were in 1909, not, you know, one pound of cheese per year, not 33 pounds of cheese per year. You know, it's, you're eating vegetables and fruits, but, but uh, inserting our modern f food products in it, look what happens to the omega-3 index. Okay? It drops. If you were to eat the regular diet that we eat today, this was in 1999, 3.84 omega-3 index. Hmm, maybe that's why we have increased incidence. Uh, one, of the, in, the, one of the statistical reasons why we would have increased incidence of Alzheimer's disease in this nation. The most striking modification to the American diet in the last century is the greater than 1,000-fold increase in the estimated per capita consumption of soybean oil. When you go to dinner tonight, tell them no oil. <laughs> Do you think they're cooking the stuff in the finest olive oil? Mm. Soybean oil is the cheapest oil. It's because we grow a hundred million acres of it, and it's really cheap. And it doesn't have a flavor like olive oil. You know, you want to make something, you want to make pancakes on the grill, right? Oil, you don't need butter. It's too expensive. We'll use soybean oil. In restaurants, this is the main oil that's used. Canola oil is too expensive. When you go to eat a fried food, if you ate a French fry, that was downstairs. Or, you know, you'd go to, it's, it's soybean oil. Just to show you how this is accumulated in our, in our bodies, um, within 50 years, uh, we have measured um, fat tissue biopsies in, in human beings. And we've demonstrated that human fat has um, accumulated so much linoleic acid that compared to human fat samples today versus 50 years ago, there's a 136% increase in linoleic acid deposition in our fat tissue. And a similar increase in linoleic acid has been found in mother's milk. Okay, I'll tell you why that's important in a moment. So um, about a three-fold increase. We've analyzed mother's milk from the 1950s, human milk, versus today's mother's milk. There's a almost triple increase in the amount of linoleic acid that is flowing through mother's milk into infants. This is why it's important. Linoleic acid is now highly suspected of causing weight gain and obesity. Has anyone heard that there's an obesity crisis in the United States? Uh, since I was a child, it is uh, weights and obesity rates have shot up uh, beyond control. I think the figures are currently that uh, perhaps one-third of the population is obese, which means they're beyond 120% of their ideal body weight, and at least half of us are overweight. What does this have to do with linoleic acid? Linoleic acid is the parent compound of arachidonic acid. Anyone hear of arachidonic acid? Arachidonic acid is the beginning of the inflammatory pathway. When you take an aspirin, a Motrin, an Advil, an Aleve, let's say you have arthritic pain uh, and you're taking it for osteoarthritis or your knee bothers you, the reason why it works 
it, it aborts or, or uh, intercepts the arachidonic acid pathway, and it stops it from creating inflammation. That's how aspirin and those associated compounds work. So the more linolenic acid you take in, the, the more it will be difficult for this process to be interrupted, the more inflammation you will have. And we now realize that um, there's, for a long time, for about two decades, we've highly suspected that obesity is, is directly related to inflammation levels in our body. And now we know that linolenic acid specifically is, there is new research on something called the endocannabinoid system. Cannabinoid, does that sound familiar to you? Pot, right? So just like marijuana, the cannabinoids, we have receptors in our system for marijuana, the cannabinoids, which, you know, naturally make us sedate and, you know, zoned out. Uh, there are receptors in our brain, in our nervous system, called endocannabinoid systems, and we think linoleic acid binds to them and then starts to change, not in a good way, our basal metabolic rate and make us burn fewer calories. So it's not just a matter of you drinking all this oil, which is, has a lot of calories in it. We think now that the linoleic acid may now be telling our bodies to, you know what, just leave all those calories there and don't burn them off. Okay. So those are the direct human effects of the way we farm. All of this 100 million acres of corn, 100 million acres of soybean. But as a farmer and environmentalist, uh, I'd like to take a moment to discuss what impact farming like this has on our environment. Okay. It has a lot of effect. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You have to remember that the vast majority of this output comes from the center of our country, right? Because that's where all the corn and soybean is gro grown. And it, it's basically pretty much grown in any state that has some water in it. You know, it's not probably grown in very dry states. But corn and soybean is definitely grown in New Jersey. And, but mostly in the central part of the nation, and it's, it drains into the Mississippi River and its tributaries, which then go into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this red area is the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. It increases in size every year. And um, last summer, it was measured at its largest. It is the size of my state, of the state of New Jersey. What does this mean in dead zone? There is no life at all in this zone, except for algal blooms. There are no dolphins. There are no fish. There are no shellfish. There's nothing there in an area the size of New Jersey, which is about 8,000 square miles. What is poisoning the water here? The fertilizers used that are running off. You need massive amounts of chemical fertilizers to grow this stuff because they're grown in huge monocultures. Plants cannot be grown like this without chemical assistance. I'm not even talking about all the, the pesticides and, and killing agents that are running in, which they are. I'm just talking about fer fertilizers do this. This is the great, one of the greatest migratory creatures on planet Earth is the monarch butterfly. Uh, they overwinter in Mexico in sacred forests and then they fly up through to Canada in the summer and back again. And um, monarchs are facing possible extinction uh, because uh, of two things. Number one, they, they have a requisite plant that they must um, eat. Their larvae must eat. It is a milkweed plant. And because uh, such vast stretches of farmland 
have been dedicated to the growing of that corn and soybean, there's no more room for any milkweed. They can't find these plants growing anywhere, so they have nothing to eat. Secondly, they're, they're um, insecticides that are used on all these crops kill butterflies. You'll see there's a bee in the corner of that picture. Honeybees are also thought to be suffering from these neonicotinoids, these new types of pesticides, which are leading to their colony collapse. Here's another effect on the health of our environment, which now directly affects us. The U.S. Geologic Survey has now measured that Roundup pours down on us in rain. When it rains, there's Roundup that is going onto us, in addition to many other pesticides that are being sprayed. What does this have to do with this vast, you know, planting of soybean and corn? Well, it's genetically modified. And what happens is uh, Monsanto and the other developers of the seed um, engineered these corn and soybean plants to be impervious to unlimited amounts of herbicides that are sprayed on them. And what happens in nature is Mother Nature always finds a way to overcome, um, you know, or plants do and insects find ways to overcome challenges. So there, because so much Roundup, uh, which is an herbicide, is being poured on these fields, there are now weeds that are popping up that are resistant to it. They don't care anymore about the Roundup. So what happens is the farmer will see this and double the Roundup and triple the Roundup. Corn doesn't care. It is impervious to Roundup. And we have found that when Roundup first started to be used, it, and by the way, Roundup or glyphosate is the number one biocide of all insecticides, fungicides, herbicides. It's the number one killing agent used in the United States, chemical killing agent. In the 90s, when they started this, when Roundup was first being used, there was not Roundup in the rain. There's a lot of Roundup in the rain now because of, there's no control over the... Um, the amounts used. Is anyone familiar with the concept of epigenetics? So, let me just explain that for a moment. Watson and Crick uh, first described DNA in the 1950s, and they won a Nobel Prize for it. it uh, what they said was, the instruction manual for how we are built is contained in each of our cells through these two little microscopic, electron microscopic strands. And you inherit one set from your mother and one set from your father. And they determine if your eyes are blue or your eyes are brown or if you're tall or if you're short. They determine who you are. Um, and we thought that's really that was really the primary determinant of who we were, how we were born, and what would happen to us. You know, I was taught in medical school that, oh, if your grandfather died of a heart attack when he was 50 and your uncle had a heart attack when he was 50, it's because you have bad genes. Is that correct? It is not correct, right? So, but they still teach it in medical school. You know that it's not correct. So I'm going to teach you something else that's not correct. Genes, the ones that are um, were first discovered and in DNA and explained by Watson and Crick, are probably not the most powerful determinant of who you are and what you will become. It's not genes, it's epigenes. <laughs> It's molecules that go on top of your genes and attach to them and straitjacket them. Was anyone here for the breast cancer talk? Okay. Yeah. Do you remember what we said? How genistine works in soybeans? It goes to your BRCA gene, the defender gene that crushes breast cancer cells, cells and rips off environmental contaminants like 
fungicides that are locked onto your BRCA genes and preventing you from fighting breast cancer. We now know that a lot of pesticides and fungicides go and attach to us epigenetically and then make control in not a good way our genes to not operate the, the way they're supposed to. And then we have found out that in our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren in subsequent um, generations, these molecules ride down through these generations. When we procreate and reproduce, we not only pass down our genes, we pass down the contaminants that are on top of the genes through the sperm and the ova, and then they cause a mutation in our children, like ADD, or like autism, is now highly suspected of, of, of being linked to all of these vast amounts of pesticides and biocides that are in the environment, and diabetes, and obesity, and cancer. Do this? sound familiar to you. So, what I'd like to do now is take a little trip back to see how we got into this mess, agriculturally. Right? It wasn't always like this. About 100 years ago, by the turn of the 20th century, farmers really didn't use chemicals. The first chemicals that came into being were things like lead arsenic. Uh, people, apple growers and fruit growers in the East used to spray this. They used to take big barrels filled with liquid lead arsenic and spray it all over because it killed everything. It killed every fungus, every living thing, right? It kills us too. Uh, today, you know, when we were looking to buy our farm, I made sure to test the soil because in there, New Jersey was a big orchard and fruit growing place a hundred years ago and when they were spraying this stuff, if they sprayed it, the soil is destroyed. It is filled with lead and arsenic and you can't, it's not hospitable to farm. Okay. So how did we get to the point where the federal government through the USDA and through its main legislative piece, which is the Farm Bill, okay, the Farm Bill is coming up now in 2018, it's a piece of legislation which is devised about every five years to figure out how money is going to be given out and, and in what ways and how farming will be and, and food and assistance for food and consumption of food will be controlled by our government. So up until the Depression, farmers really didn't get much help from the federal government. They were left alone. And then what happened leading up to the Depression, uh, in the Roaring Twenties, a lot of farmers overextended themselves. Does that sound familiar to you? And they started buying a lot of land and houses to, and they borrowed too much money. And by the time the Depression came, I think the year was 1932, when um, the first assistance came from the federal government, that year 400,000 family farms went under. 400,000. They couldn't pay their mortgages. Roosevelt decided to step in. And what Roosevelt decided to do is through one, the Works Progress Administration, he created like a Farm Assistance Act, and he decided to um, do two things. To help by giving farmers subsidies, um, they wanted to control uh, the markets so that farmers were not producing too much and then the prices would be too low. So they kind of told farmers, hey, if, if they figured something was being grown too much of, they said, lay off that. And then the federal government also stepped in with subsidies to, con to, um, to uh, well, they, they did it in a number of ways. They would tell farmers not to plant, like certain acreage, if they thought there was going to be too much of a crop. 
and they would they would pay them actually for not planting, and then they would the government would control the supply also of the food by storing certain foods if there was enough as a reservoir to shield also shield against price fluctuations, and this worked. It helped the farmers, and this system. Um, all of a sudden stabilized family farms and through the rest of the mid-30s there were no more farms going under. And everything changed, guess in what year? 1971? 72? 70? Around there? President Nixon appointed this man as the department, the depart, secretary for the Department of Agriculture, his name is Earl Butts. And Earl Butts had two mantras. He said the following to the family farmer. He said, plant fence row to fence row. In other words, there should not be a square inch of anything. We don't want any milkweed. We don't want any native species. We just want monocrop oblivion. Just corn, 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 corn. Soybean, 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 soybean. Wheat, 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 wheat. No other plants. If you have to dig up wetlands, dig them up. Put it in there. So they're extremely environmentally insensitive. And then he said, get big. You do this or you get out. Start to buy more land. You know, get, buy more acreage. Assemble yourself into huge, you know, get a lot of machinery. Because a family farm can't be operated just with, you know, a son and a daughter or a couple of boys, whatever. You need to get a lot of, invest in a lot of equipment and to run a lot of acreage. So this encouraged the development of the agribusiness. Industrialized sized farms, which could which now are on the scale of 10,000 acres, 15,000 acres. So our farm in Long Valley is one of the biggest farms in New Jersey. It's an ancient farm, it's 275 years old. It's very large, it's 342 acres. It's one of the biggest in New Jersey. We're talking about 10,000, 15,000, okay? All spread with one plant of one genetic type. Yeah, that's why that's not a natural scenario. You can only something like that can only grow with the support of chemicals. Um, and this is what he had to say about not using chemicals. Before we go back to organic agriculture, somebody is going to have to decide what 50 million people we are going to let starve. Earl Butts said that. So he was a proponent of all these chemicals that are now raining down on us. And what he did was he pulled away the subsidies from family farmers. He said, you're not going to get any money to continue this operation unless you, unless you apply yourself to this system. So it was yes or no. And guess what happened? What do you, if you were a family farmer, and you had like, a, you know, in the middle of Indiana, you had a thousand acres and you were growing whatever, you know, mixed some, some cabbages, you're growing some corn or whatever, and this came in. What would happen to you if you tried, you tried to buy up more and more land, right? Get rid of the cabbage, get rid of variety, okay? You need to have one plant, one of these two plants, and you need to grow it. Uh, well, as everyone started competing with each other and all this corn and soybean came online, guess what happened to the price? It hit the bottom. And then, in, in order to survive in that economy, you needed to have 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 acres. Because of economy of scale, you could really only survive if you had that much production. Did anyone hear of Willie Nelson, do you remember Farm Aid? When did it occur? In the 1980s, 10 years later, right? It was a replay all over again of what happened in the Depression. 
family farms going out of business. They, he still has farming concerts to raise millions of dollars to help family farmers because they cannot survive economically in this uh, scheme. To me, as a doctor, his legacy is this. That's why we see all these signs on Main Street with McDonald's and, and, and you know, McDonald's hamburgers. Without this, they wouldn't be $5, they'd be $15. If, if cows had to, for a couple of years, had to graze on a range somewhere, or if they had to buy some kind of more expensive fat to fry French fries in, we wouldn't have all this crap lining our aisles. We'd have real food. So his legacy is this, which resulted in this, which resulted in this. You get the connections now, right? Here's what is the most maddening thing, that the USDA has a vast conflict of interest. So their, their primary business is trying to drum up business for farmers, okay? Farmers who are making meat, not only, well, these days, not farmers, it's agribusinesses, it's vast, and they're not family farmers, okay? If you look at the money that's poured out by the farm bill today to farmers, very few family farmers get any money at all. They go to vast businesses making many tens of millions of dollars a year. They take the subsidies. So their interest is in that, in producing how can we make sure that that, that that facility that has a thousand milkers in it, how can we make sure that that milk that they're producing gets into human beings, that it's sold, that, and that it's handled properly? Or how can we make sure that, that all this, these huge amounts of GMO corn get used? Okay. Versus their other task, which they're supposed to do is, they're supposed to advise us on what's healthy to eat. Do you see a conflict? So how can they advise us on what's healthy to eat if their primary business is making sure that all this crap is grown and the and these industries are paid for? It? They can't. And that's why we need your help in calling them and writing letters to tell that you're listening and you're aware of this now. It's got to stop. We'll get to how you're going to help in a moment. Not only is there a conflict of interest in them taking care of, you know, making sure, ensuring that the products that are grown by these businesses are consumed, they have specific programs, okay, that use hundreds of millions of dollars a year to find ways to market it to you. For example, if you go to, you know, this was an article from the New York Times, Domino's sales were flagging. And so there's a, a special dairy marketing group that is run by the USDA that tries to find ways to push more cheese into Americans. And Domino's was very successful at this. Domino's came to this marketing group and said, hey, we have to sell more pizza. And this marketing um, organization run by the USDA, okay, figured out ways for Domino's pizza to have double, cheap, double the amount of cheese on their pizzas. This double stuffed crust, whatever, that was their idea too. Like, who would think of putting cheese inside the dough of a pizza? The USDA did, to give us more of it. Do you see why Neil Barnard says, right? Cheese consumption, disease, everything keeps rising. Our tax dollars are used to fund people who are poor who cannot eat. They don't have enough money to eat. This is called food stamps. Okay? It's one of the programs that makes us the great society, right? That we can help to take care of people who are less fortunate than we are, who may be able to buy food. But 
the USDA, through the Farm Bill legislation, has determined that they will pay for soda with high fructose corn syrup, cheese, cake, candies. You can use your, your they're called snap dollars today, not food stamps, to buy all of this stuff. And con uh, concordantly, we see that, of course, poor people have a lot of diseases. They have more than their fair share of these chronic diseases. Is there any wonder why? Last June, I was fortunate enough uh, to have the honor of being invited by Neil Barnard to go to the AMA's national convention in Chicago. And with the help of Neil Barnard, about 20 of us doctors stood up and demanded that the AMA state in a platform, as one of the planks of their platform policies, that the USDA, through the Farm Bill, should not fund junk food. They should fund real food for people to eat. And of course, we could not say don't fund meat and chicken. Fish could not say that because we would have been closed down. We just said, please not soda and things that are you know, highly processed. And maybe have special ways to encourage people or incentivize them to eat more vegetables. So now we're going to come to the solution part of what we can do. The general idea is we should encourage the USDA to stop subsidizing unsustainable. So they, they subsidize production and consumption. They give farm, farm businesses money to grow all this stuff, and then they subsidize us to eat it. We need to stop that. And we should start subsidizing uh, sustainable production and, and consumption of healthy food. The first thing is we should eliminate these subsidies. We need to go back to the way it was before the Great Depression. Okay. Mm. Plant eaters, the kinds, of, the kinds of foods that people have been eating today on the ship, the vegetables, the whole grains, the legumes, the mushrooms, the seeds and nuts, those kinds of things, the growers of these in the United States, they get no subsidies from the United States. Did you know that? None. They get no subsidies from the federal government, right? They seem to do okay. Let's eliminate subsidies for those items. They're just going to create cheap meat and chicken and all those other things and contaminate our environment. We should redesign the SNAP and school lunch programs. So that step of going to Chicago last year and 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 demanding that the AMA, which Congress listens to sometimes because it's the main health doctor's health organization in the United States, getting the AMA to say, hey, in our medical opinion, it's not good. You should try not to feed people and buy their soda and candies for them. Okay? And by the way, for the school lunch programs, all the warehouses of excess cheese that the government tries to buy up to stabilize the price of milk ends up in our schools, fattening up our children. And lastly, we should incentivize the American public to eat more whole plant foods. This is the thing I'm most excited about. So let me explain this specific program to you. Um, as far as production of better food, you know, th that's, uh, uh, there, are many, um, there are many minefields. The Farm Bill is extremely complicated. It's a lot of money, and there are many vested interests battling to get this money. And I think that rather than trying to give money to people to grow more vegetables and good healthy foods, we should just give money 
to people to eat the foods. And if we do that, there will be more of a demand and then more of this stuff will be grown, right? So there is a nationwide program that was extremely successful. It was run in South Africa. Guess who ran it? A health insurance company ran it. It wasn't the federal government of South Africa. And in this program, this large health insurer uh, gave a, a roughly a $500 a month benefit to per family to buy vegetables and fruits. Hundreds of thousands of people took advantage of it. It significantly increased the amounts of these healthy foods eaten and had a positive impact on health parameters. Why don't we take some of that subsidy money pull it out from the corn and soybean producers and give it to us guys to eat more plants, right? Wouldn't you like that? For free. Okay, you like that idea? Okay, we can contact Congressman Conaway. Congressman Conaway is the chair of the Congressional Ag Committee. And, and that committee, and he personally, is responsible for drafting the 2018 Farm Bill, which decides who gets what. How, well, should there be subsidies? Should people be paid to be grown in corn, or should they not be paid? What kind of insurance program should they have? It, all mixed up in there is also the SNAP program and school lunch programs. So I know I, I covered a bewildering set of information here and if you want you can write down uh, here are the the contacts in his office here's the telephone number 202-225-2171 it's his main office number here's for comments on commodities and farm policy trevor white here is his email and for comments on snap and school lunch program jennifer pillar but it, it's, it's a lot, I know, for the uninitiated to start talking to. So, uh, we have written a letter for you. <laughs> if you want to send it and sign your name to it, or even if you want to call them and read it on the telephone, because now I understand uh, that maybe they may not be looking at emails so much. You, you take their staff's time, a good five minutes, and read this letter to them on the phone. And uh, if you're into that, um, you can contact uh, our uh, farm office. Uh, the address is info at myethoshealth.com and tell Gail, G-A-I-L, that you, wanna, you want us to send a copy of this letter to you. One more time. Info at myethoshealth.com. E-T-H-O-S. E Does anyone know what ethos means? Okay. So ethos is it comes from the root for ethical it's the ancient greek root and um, ethos is a philosophy or a, a set of ideals that either a person or a community or a company or some kind of organization or a nation has like the nation's ethos or this is our church's ethos or this is our community's ethos and the reason why our farm is called Ethos Farm and Ethos Health is because, um, you know, I told you previously, we have a very old farm. It was 275 years old, very beautiful. And um, it was almost destroyed three times in the last 50 years by development. First. They wanted to build an industrial park on it. It was slated for development. Then uh, a housing development 
in the, in the 70s, and then Toll Brothers was under contract to buy it in the 90s. And finally, uh, the town of Long Valley, the townspeople, and they don't have a lot of money, but they spend $12 million to just buy the development rights of our farm without any hope, without any knowledge that they were ever going to get their money back. Um, and they don't have a lot of money there. And when the state of New Jersey and the county of Morris saw this, the next year they came and they gave them the money back. The $12 million of their tax base. That's why we named it DFAS. So, if you remember, we talked about in the beginning how we really don't have a health care system. It is a medical care system. Imagine if we could cut out 86% of that $3.2 trillion. That's, trillion. that's trillions of dollars every year. Can you imagine what kind of free, real health care we could get for ourselves? How about sending kids to college for free, too? And doing other things that, are, that would build us into a great society. This is a wonderful idea that Bernie Sanders had, that we should all have this universal health care. But he doesn't understand. It's not health care. Medicare is medical care for all. We need to change the system into a health care system. And we do it by changing the foods that we grow. Let's get going.